Welcome to On Texas Football. It's state of the program time. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by Jerry Hamilton of OnTexasFootball.com. Thank you to Adam Lowy, our sponsor of the Lowy Law Firm. Uh, Jerry, uh, each and every week, you and I get together and try to talk about the state of the program. Next week, we're going to start a new thing where it's going to be you, me, and C.J. Vogel. Since C.J.'s moved on from the morning show, we're going to try to do a weekly show with just you, me, and C.J. on state of the program. Uh, it should be interesting. I want to get that programming note out. But before we start, a couple things that we want to talk about today. What's going on with the team behind the scenes uh, right now? There are 11 Longhorns drafted, or not drafted, excuse me, in the NFL Combine that were invited. That's a record number of late. Uh, and then obviously, Chris Del Conte on Tuesday had a town hall meeting about the Longhorns and uh, the future of Texas athletics amidst the backdrop of an uncertain NCAA and NIL framework. Yeah that is just uh, really difficult for anybody to really get get their eyes on or hands around uh, and understand it uh, truly. All right, let, let's start with what's going on behind the scenes right now with the team, whether it's recruiting or team news. What, let's start with recruiting. What are the big pieces of news and information from a, a macro perspective that people need to know about? Yeah, so I think your the visit dates for the spring are starting to kind of get out there, right? March 22nd, 23rd, 24th weekend, there's a big seven-on-seven seven tournament in the Austin area. So there's going to be a number of 2025, 2026 prospects that will stop by campus in Austin that weekend around that seven-on-seven seven, uh, tournament. And that will be national teams as well as teams from Texas. Uh, then I think in April – uh, we've seen two weekends come about is for visits, um, and that is April 13th, 14th. There's a four-star uh, defensive back out of IMG that's originally from Hopewell coming in that weekend that Blake Gideon said that's the weekend they wanted to come in. So that's obviously a weekend they're targeting. Then the spring game's April 20th, uh, and there's a number of – I mean, there may be 100 kids at that spring game, right? We'll, we'll have to see how that – number shakes out because there are other spring games that weekend. But those are your three spring official visit dates right now. There will be kids trickle through um, in late March, early April. I mean, when kids can get in. Uh, but those are your three big dates, I think, for the spring. And then we have our two June visit dates have already popped out there. June 14th through 16th, uh, John Mills, the uh, uh, on Texas football four-star guard out of San Francisco, will be making an official visit that weekend. Then there's the last weekend of June. Uh, so that is, which is a 28 through 30. So there are three, four guys that we've already heard will be making those the visit that weekend, but they haven't put out their dates yet. So those are five big dates. That doesn't mean there won't be a couple of official visitors at different weekends in June, but it's just like last year. There's two big June visit weekends. Then the spring game's huge because the Brandon Baker recruitment actually got kick-started at the spring game last year. Then he came back in for a June official visit, and then Texas closed the deal. Gotcha. So I'm just looking at it. You're saying right now from a recruiting perspective, it's they're just recruiting, continuing to do yeah. outreach, can't go out to see kids right now. Yeah. Yeah, the They're going to bring guys into them mostly in March right now. Uh, they get back started on uh, on the football field March 19th. Yeah. They return to the football field. The team does. March 20th is pro day. And then that following weekend, that March 23rd, 24th time frame, is when Texas actually can get back in pads. On yes. the football field because the first couple of pit, we uh, practices everybody has to remember can't be in pads. They can be only in helmets and shoulder pads or helmets and and you know small small not full pads. They'll they'll probably bring those guys in around a time Jerry where they can actually see a full padded practice. So that's interesting. And then April you forward to that April twentieth uh, uh, spring game. Texas A and M has their spring game on that same date as well, and I believe OU does too. Yes. So very interesting there. Uh, and then the two visit weekends, as you mentioned, would be in June, uh, just like a year ago. They had the last two weekends of June back to back. They had like 15 and 15 kids on campus. Out of that time, I think 18 of the 23 commitments uh, that they ended up signing were in those two visit dates. Uh, so that's the that's the macro perspective of what's going and on. And one other thing I missed in between those spring visits and the June official visits is the spring evaluation period which begins late April, goes through May. And that is huge because, look, there's, there's 10, 12 kids that could probably call Sarkeesian and commit right now, right? But the rest of this board is still developing. And Texas, this staff is going to use the spring evaluation period 
to really lock in that board and who they're really going to push for those official visits. Uh, so this spring evaluation period is very critical uh, and important for uh, Texas coming up here in late April, early May. In between there, too, is, is sandwiched is the portal. Yes. The portal opens again on April 15th. Now, we may hear names leak out that are going to put their name in the portal before then, but Texas and, and folks can't actually really act on it until that April 15th to 30 window. They can do some stuff behind the scenes if people are going in it's, or have entered the portal, but the actual portal window of actually taking visits, et cetera, won't be until April 15th through 30th, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so all of that sandwiched together, that's really what's going on recruiting. We believe that Texas is looking for at least one defensive tackle in the portal, possibly uh, a um, possibly a punter as well. All right, uh, before I go to the next topic, uh, which is going to be all those guys going to Tex going to the combine for the University of Texas, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Every State of the Program, brought to you by Adam Lowy of the Lowy Law Firm. If you've been injured in a car wreck, truck wreck, motorcycle, what have you, and think you might be due compensation from a poor driver, give Adam a call or, or, to, or just visit him online, lowylawfirm.com. They'll give you a free consultation. The consultation is absolutely free to determine whether they believe you might be due uh, money because of the injury that you sustained. All right, let's talk about this. Uh, Longhorns come out, the, the, the release of names yesterday uh, from uh, the NFL about who they had invited to the NFL Combine included 11 Longhorns. Uh, the usual suspects, which we all thought there were about eight or nine of those, plus Jordan Whittington, yep. Ryan Watts, and Keelan Robinson. Even Keelan Robinson gets an NFL Combine invite, probably because of his role as a kind of a boutique running back, return game, and his success as a gunner at the University of Texas. Just to tell you how highly he was thought of, he gets an invite, a Combine invite. All right, I want to ask you a couple of questions that relate as it relates to this. Yeah. Any surprises for you in that group? Okay. And then, I mean, what do you make of the value it presents to the University of Texas and Sark from a recruiting perspective? Yeah, so on the surface, not surprised. And here's why, Bobby. The 320 guys, players are invited to the combine. 321, I think is the exact number. But I think you and I have both spoken to some people around the NFL draft that there may be a few more of those fringe guys who would enter a year early staying in college for NIL purposes. And that helps your senior guys, Ryan Watts, Jordan Whittington, Keelan Robinson, get those combine invites and maybe rise a little bit on those boards because there may not be the sixth, seventh round depth of talent with as many underclassmen as there has been in years past because guys are sticking around for NIL. Uh, purposes, right? Which that makes total sense. Uh, but I, I think it's I, I think it's great for Sarkeesian in Texas, right? I mean, Michigan at eighteen, right? I mean, I think you said Bobby five of the top seven teams uh, that, as far as numbers of players in the combine were, you know, your five five top teams in in college football this yep. year, right? I mean, so it, it, it makes total sense. And the big key here is, I what I think is going to happen with Texas. And I think it's going to go, and Sark's going to speak to this with culture. And I think he he kind of talked about this at the Shrine Bowl. He, he expects nine, ten guys to be drafted. The, the, I, or the One of the reasons I think he's going there, Bobby, is I think he thinks his guys are going to interview well. I, I think he thinks these guys are going to be popular with, with NFL personnel. The Keelan Robinson, who is a gunner and return man and willing to play a role. Jordan Whittington. He was the best blocker on the perimeter on the Texas team. He played a role. He, these guys are going to interview well, uh, aside from testing. But I, I really think this interview process with these NFL teams, I, I think Sarkeesian knows he's got some guys that are going to be very impressive uh, to NFL teams. But if he hits on his number, 9, 10 guys drafted, uh, that would be amazing for the Texas Longhorns in year three. I think it's interesting too because you look at guys like who are the 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 Sark recruits versus the Herman recruits yeah. versus portal. Okay, so the only portal guys in this group are Keelan Robinson, Ad Mitchell, and Ryan Watts. Yeah, so that's three of the eleven are portal. Okay, and all of those guys right, except for Mitchell were are, so Robinson and. Uh, Watts were both two-year guys or three-year guys. 
Um, then you have uh, A.D. Mitchell, who was a one-year, what essentially a rental of, of right. sorts, right? So of the of the eleven, three are transfers. One of them, only one of them, is a true Xavier, is a true Sark recruit, and that's Xavier Worthy. Now, Jonathan Brooks and J.T. Sanders, they were part, uh, and Byron Murphy, they were part of Sark's first recruiting class. But to be fair, Tom Herman had recruited those guys. Correct. The rest were development. I, I look at development of guys like Tavondre Sweat and Christian Jones and even Jordan Whittington to a degree and say, you know what? Sark and his team can go back and show people they have a blueprint yes. for how to develop people. Yes. And that's whether you, and, and then I say all of this. So that's whether you're our own recruit, someone else's recruit. We get you two years uh, in the portal. You come to us as your freshman or sophomore campaign, or we only get you for one year. No matter any fish you wish, it's Larry's fish house. You, yeah, order exactly. you, you know what I mean? And so if you're a recruit on any of those planes, we have a spot for you and we have proof in the pudding that we can make something happen for you. And, and to take that a step further, Bobby, Jatavion Sanders was a, ed, a defensive end and outside receiver in high school. They developed him at the tight end position. Tavondre Sutt was 265 pounds as a senior. He's 360 pounds. He needs to trim some weight, honestly, but he's he's been developed. Byron Murphy, 270-pound guy, is starting his senior year, maybe 275. He was physically developed, technically developed, to your point. Um, and so I, if you look at those guys, but I also think then there's this. Guys who had patience, and I think this is going to be a big part of Sark's selling point in recruiting to guys who they think are very good that contemplate going in the portal. Jonathan Brooks Brook stuck it out. Tavondre Sweat stuck it out. Byron Murphy stuck it out. Those guys, they could have left at any point in time, right? I mean, Keandre Coburn was a locked-in guy. Moro Ojemo, locked-in guy. Those guys played, but they were still behind some older guys. Jonathan Brooks obviously was behind two NFL running backs. Uh, so if you look at that, and, and they've developed guys, and then they've had guys that, guys that have been patient and ended up having really good success and are now going to go change their lives uh, forever. So I think there's all sorts of great recruiting points for Steve Sarkeesian with this. And there's this. Keelan Robinson was a guy who, you know, obviously Banks and Sarkeesian knew about in high school when they were at Alabama. But he came to Texas and bought into a role and if he had just been a running back only, he's probably not invited to the combine. But the fact that he's a gunner, he's a return man, and he's bought into all these things, pump block guy. that He's bought into the Texas culture, the program, and bought into this staff, believing in this staff to give him a chance that football is a career. These are all great selling points for Sark. I think that's, the, that's what I'm getting at. Yep. Each and every way you can think of it, He's got a little arrow in the quiver, no doubt, there to shoot the it took for an archery term, you know. Yeah. I think that that's where I think it matters from a from a big picture perspective for Texas. You have all of these things at your disposal. Okay, all right, let's move on to the next piece, and that was Chris Del Conte's town yeah. last night. Okay, we've talked about this. There were several notes of, of value. Okay, moving to, from field turf to grass at DKR in the 26th season. That's the plan. Unveiled the renderings of the new uh, football only complex. It is a gorgeous looking facility. It, it, it's going to be right next. It's on the behind the South end zone further across the street. It'll include a grass practice field. Okay. As well as an indoor practice field. Interesting stuff there. So that it is a, if you haven't seen it, get a chance to see it. It is absolutely gorgeous. Okay. Also uh, going to do create a left field plexiglass kind of left field place for people at Dish Falls. It's a see-through experience in left field. Used to, you'd be behind, be behind the green wall up near the scoreboard and you'd be sitting on top of a bus, right? Now they're actually going to be able to go in there and just walk in and see it through the, through the lens of the outfield fence, which will be a straight plexiglass kind of see-through thing. Um, and then... You know, he talked about ticket prices and stuff like that. What, what were some of the things that you took away that you want to talk about? Because I think, honestly, that's a must watch, in my opinion, if yeah, you're a Texas. Is. 
Hall of Fame. You, I, I think the indoor facility is massive, massive. Uh, and I say the same thing about Florida Gators. They've needed that four years. That is one of the missing pieces for them in recruiting. Uh, and not that it's a missing piece for Texas, but, right, it's just about maximizing everything you have. Uh, and, and I think that's been an, one thing that's been lacking for Texas a little bit. I don't think it necessarily cost them recruits. Not winning games cost you recruits more so than not having uh, a top-line indoor practice facility. Uh, but I think it just adds to uh, the bells and whistles, maximizes what the University of Texas football program can be. Um, I thought moving the, the grass field announcement in 2026 is big as well. Uh, I think there's a number of things you can look at, whether it's uh, it makes it going to make it a little cooler for the players on the field. I, I think I, when I think of SEC football, I think of grass stadiums, Alabama, Georgia, LSU. You know, that's what we think of with the SEC, right? Um, I, and I, the sport turf was a big upgrade from uh, from AstroTurf, as you mentioned on coffee and football. But I do think it will help injury prevention on some level long term, uh, just large humans hitting the ground, right, um, and, and doing it at a fast rate of speed and with other large humans falling on top of them. Uh, but uh, the thing that impressed me most was the other sports, okay, the, the continued maximization of baseball, the beach volleyball, which is a new sport, right? I mean, me, women's volleyball has won national championships. I think beach volleyball probably will too. Um, I think they're going to create a great fan experience there. But moving to the SEC, everything has to get better. Uh, because name a sport that's easier. People would argue bat, men's basketball probably because the Big 12 becomes becoming such a juggernaut with the new teams that have entered the conference and will enter the conference next year. But every sport has to keep stepping up uh, to maximize the capability they have. And that was my takeaway is, is the University of Texas CDC, I think he's unbelievable with fan experience at the University of Texas and student athlete experience at the University of Texas. But they're moving closer to maximizing every sport and everything they can. And that's how you continue to be the number one uh, program in the country for college athletics and go into a more demanding conference in every sport and continue to have success. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think my biggest takeaway, though, and, and I mentioned that I've mentioned this before, is for folks who think that Texas is just thinking to the next month or three months away, there's a new scoreboard. Right. A new, the, the scoreboard's going to be tricked out a little bit different. Um, for, for fans that think it's just, oh, well, we should do this and it'll happen in the next month or something, watching that town hall, you got a true sense of a long-term vision for what Texas wants to be in athletics. Yeah. They want to be fan-friendly and create an experience, to your point. They want to be reasonably priced so that you can take your family and go do it. And then they want to have a great team and provide that team with all the creature comforts, right? They want to be, and I, and I, I say this because it's, it's trite, but you know, the, the doctrine of the University of Texas is a university of the, fir of the first class, okay? That's what he's trying, I think, uh, C CDC is trying to carry out with the football and game day experiences across the entire student body uh, and student athlete selection that he's kind of in charge of. By the way, he mentioned 573 is the number of student athletes they have on campus out of 52,000 students. So that's roughly one out of every 100 person on the University of Texas campus is a student athlete. That's not very big. That's not like an overwhelming population. And, yeah. and so I, I think it's very interesting how he is thinking for the future, thinking how to improve fan engagement and fan experience while also supporting the team. One of the things he mentioned clearly was NIL and its importance yeah. and mentioning the Texas One Fund. Uh, TexasOneFund.org. He, he seems to, he is grasping and putting forward a clear-eyed vision of what he wants the University of Texas Athletic Department to be. And frankly, Jerry, I, I'm bought in. It, like, it, I, I could, watching that, I could see his vision and I concur with it. And, and let's uh, talk about why the facilities are important in all sports. Look at the decline of Miami Hurricanes football. When kids in, in Dade and Broward County 
started getting out and seeing the world years ago, and they went to Alabama and Tennessee and Georgia and all these places and saw the facilities and what else was out there, Miami got left behind. Michigan and, and Ohio State. Michigan, Ohio State. And Texas is now moving into the arms race conference for facilities. It's the SEC. Make no mistake. Look at the upgrades AM made moving into the SEC. They knew they had to. Georgia's facility is phenomenal. Tennessee, you just go down the list. Florida's finally upgrading some of their facilities, which fell behind, right? You this is an arms race, and you and for and to be to have to give that great athlete experience and have as many of those future, you want great student athletes, but future pro athletes. These people, all these prospects, whether it's volleyball or what, they want to go where they feel like they have a chance to be a pro. And it all factors in in getting those, that level of talent to your university that maximize what you can do as a program. Yeah, very good stuff. I, I also want to mention this. One last thing that I loved, the idea of, that they mentioned last night, uh, Jerry, there's going to be an illuminated – Longhorn, love it. That you can see from I-35 now as part of the athletic facility complex. You think about that when you drive by people that drive by I-35 at night in Austin, going wherever. You can see the tower. You can see yep. the Moody Center. You can see. Uh, you can even see the stadium. Of course, that's always been there. But you've never had that big fat Longhorn logo and that white or orange background that really set the tone closer to I-35. Del Conte has said he's going to remedy that. So that, I thought that was a, a great, I mean, that's understanding a little bit more about branding, right? And where you're going as a university. And I said this on coffee and football, anybody that's driven along I-10 in Baton Rouge, they see at night, they see the purple around the LSU illuminated around the football stadium at LSU and around the university. That is marketing for university. That will that Texas, that Longhorn will appear on social media everywhere. It's another bell and whistle. It's very important, though. Yeah. All right. I want to say thanks uh, one last time to our sponsor, each and every state of the program, brought to you by Adam Lowy, the Lowy Law Firm. If you've been injured in a car wreck, motorcycle accident, truck. Give Adam and his group a chance to earn your business to see if you're actually due some compensation. Go to LowyLawFirm.com. That's LowyLawFirm.com. Get a free 15-minute consultation. Adam and the guys will, will uh, and, and females will help you out there. LoweyLawFirm.com. Adam, thanks again for your ongoing sponsorship of uh, On Texas Football. Jerry, anything final you want to mention as we look forward to the week ahead, if you can think about it? What are we going to be talking about? I mean, I know CJ's out at Westlake High School today. You're going to go do some high school visits for recruiting. Anything else that uh, you want to kind of put a pin in the cap? Baseball, our baseball starts this weekend. Basketball. Baseball, hey, look, basketball Saturday, Houston, Texas at Houston. Four-figure ticket prices for the last meeting between Texas and Houston at Houston before Texas moves to the SEC. Uh, so uh, basketball, got big, big stretch coming up. I think they look good for the NCAA tournament, even if they go 8-10 and 10 in conference play. But you got to at least get to 8-10. and 10. All right. All right, that's going to do it. Uh, good stuff, Jerry. I hope you guys enjoyed stay of the program. Uh, I'm Bobby Burton for Jerry Hamilton. Uh, this has been On Texas Football. Welcome.